as cameras circle, news feeds buzz. This woman's grief points like a finger to a truth beyond proof. Its red crescent still just visible. This vest is Mercy's banner, sunset stained. Hello, Naomi. Welcome to Meet the Poet. Thank you so much for coming along. Hello, Laurie. Um, Thank you for having me. It's a real pleasure to have you here. So, I mean, let's kick off by hearing a little bit about your journey into poetry. How did it all begin for you? Well, my mother was a poet, my late mother, Brenda Riches, um, or Brenda MacDonald Riches, as she uh, liked to be known later on. Uh, she was born in India. Um, their family was a Scottish family in the Raj, and they left at independence and came to England. Uh, and she, you know, loved loved poetry, loved, loved writing, um, studied English at Cambridge, uh, and you know, always had dreams of being a writer. And it wasn't really until she came to Canada that she started to find her voice. Uh, we came to Canada when I was seven. So I basically grew up knowing that my mother had this secret life, you know, behind this <laughs> closed door. Um, and I used to avidly read her work and, you know, search for signs, you know, of, you know, her relationship with me and, you know, which I did find because she did write about the family. Uh, she published three books and she was also a very well-known, highly regarded editor in Canada. She edited Grain magazine for many years. So I would also see her going through the, you know, going through the submissions and she'd share her um, her thought processes with me um, around the poetry that she was, she was editing, you know, protecting the identities of the poets, of course. Uh, and actually, as a child, I wanted to be an actor, which... Um, yeah, I've only just, which is interesting to me in relation to uh, the diagnosis I recently had in, in December 2020 of autism spectrum condition, because it's a condition that's very masked in girls and women, um, and partly because in many cases, girls tend to want to connect. And so they study human beings and they become the little psychologist and they learn how to, how to interact and in a sense to act. So... I was very shy as a child and I did write poetry actually from an early age and my mother really encouraged me but it was an act you know I wanted to be an actor as I was a teenager growing up but then eventually I at university I started to become quite shy around auditioning and the and the writing had been you know percolating and then it just sort of took off and took over and I I wrote a poetry cycle based on the Pied Piper of Hamelin that became a song cycle uh, that was then eventually adapted into an opera. Uh, so that was a, quite a significant professional success for me to have where just as I was graduating as an undergraduate. Uh, it was called uh, Hush, an opera in two bestial acts and it was produced uh, at Theatre Pass Marais, uh, directed by Peter Hinton with a uh, score by Alan Cole. Uh, and after that, I I had graduated, I'd had this play or opera produced, and, and I just wanted to, I just felt like, what, what, what adventure will life show me next? So I went traveling and I went through Europe and I did a lot of writing poetry in Europe and I really identified with, you know, Arthur Rimbaud and, you know, the, the nomad and the, and the rebel. Uh, and so that sort of set my poetic sites I think yeah it's really interesting actually hearing you talk about the way that autism related to that and like, do you feel like poetry was a is, is a space of authenticity for you as opposed to the performativity of acting yes absolutely and it, what was always quite interesting is that although I remained very quiet and shy even you know as kind of a young person where as soon as I got on stage and was reciting or performing my own poems you know just this fire came out and people would often say things like whoa better out than in you know? um, and so it was really clear that I was all very I was really quite buttoned up um, in many many other circumstances perhaps not with my, with my very close friends but you know to just casual acquaintances there was a marked difference between how I was in person and how I was on stage and reading my work and and I always like to push the boundaries in my work and I always wrote about 
quite taboo and perhaps sexual topics and you know it's just and that's you know every autistic person is different but for me I think that was a space of just trying to be really honest about things um, that I felt socially are all covered up you know under convention in a way that you know I felt you know still feel is is unhelpful um yeah and you have a poem that kind of speaks to this don't you I wonder if you might like to read that first thank you I think I would um so this is a poem from my first collection the night pavilion since my diagnosis I've been you know really reassessing a lot of things everything in my life really uh but including my poetry so going back to to this collection um published in 2008 the the flat poem there's a poem this is there's the the night pavilion so there's a front flat poem called the angel lanarchy which is after the bust by eileen agar which is she's blindfolded and so that had a sense to me of being masked and there is the the image of the mask in in the poem but this one also um miss dickinson regrets uh i think expresses what was going on or like the effort in constructing this self really um and what was behind this constructed self and also i think there's an interesting obviously relationship with emily dickinson you can't diagnose people you know retrospectively um, or historically but i suspect that many autistic women have a and affin- feel an affinity with miss dickinson blandishments and tourniquets won't stem the surgeon's gash i left my rib cage on the beach my brain pan in the wash. My heart I folded in a cloth and placed it in a basin. With my skin I stitched a cloak, no sleeves to slip your ace in. I left my flesh so far behind, your love to forage for. Now with ancient teeth I munch, starry porridge roar. My face remains in lockets, you lost inside a drawer. Be careful turning back your clocks. Inside their slow infernal works, I spat one sharpened claw. I'm actually reading it again. I think, you know, this image of turning back the clocks and that, you know, what I've been trying to do over the last, you know, year. Um, just look back in, in, inside those mechanisms and see how they were working and try and pull out all the hairs and gunk and try and, you know, get my mechanism working the way that, that it, it can now, now that I, you know, know this central fact about myself. Mm. Do you think that that's just reshaped how you have, ex- how you see the world, how you see your life and yourself having that diagnosis? It does really, because, you know, there I was, you know, roaming around, kind of refusing to join the adult world after university. You know, I graduated with actually a very good degree and I could have gone on immediately and done the MA and entered an academic career. I just had this success in theatre. I could have just stayed and set myself up. But I just knocked that all down like a house of cards and went to Europe, roamed around, ended up in, in England where I was born. So I had a, you and I have a UK passport and was able to stay here. But, you know, I was on the dole, working, you know, a little bit cash in hand, you know, in a bookshop and um, just trying to write, you know, getting my poems published, you know. So I was feeling like I was accomplishing some things I, I wanted to do. But I, I was there, there's a sense of refusal of sort of joining the, 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 the engine of society, really. I kind of wanted to be the spanner in the works instead. And I look now, I understand that's very much to do with, with, with autism. There's a kind of a stubbornness and a holding to your values, you know, and a very strong sense of right and wrong. Uh, and so I was really trying my best not to collude, although, you know, as you grow older, you just recognize that, you know, you have to really, you know, you and, and also that if you do and you do gain some power, then you have some power to do some good in the world, which is how I try, how I see, you know, my teaching. Um, yeah and other activism that I've done. So, uh, you know. I mean, speaking of this activism, that is something that really carries a lot of your writing. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, you've got some fantastic poems lined up to read and they're very much influenced by your um, your cultural activism um, and politics. I wonder if we could hear the next poem, which I believe is Indelible. Indelible, yes, thank you. So this is a poem that's come out of my activism for a just peace in Israel-Palestine, which 
began, my activism for that began around 2000, well, 2009, 2010. It was 2008 and nine that Christmas New Year period, um, where what, what's the Israelis called Operation Cast Lead occurred, which was the, you know, about three week bombing of, of Gaza. And that was being that being televised, you know, I I got just totally transfixed by it every night. And and then I, you know, feeling very paralyzed about it, feeling very angry that this could be claimed to be somehow the Palestinians' fault, that they brought it on themselves, you know. Um, so I started going to local meetings in Brighton. Uh, and then the following year, I went to Gaza. I tried, so I didn't go to Gaza. I went to Cairo to try and get involved, tried to go to Gaza to go on the Gaza Freedom March to mark the anniversary. Uh, but we weren't allowed to go. But coming by the Egyptian government, so we protested in Cairo instead. And while I was there, uh, I met South Africans who were working on boycott. And it just seemed to me that that was the thing I could do um, in, you know, as who, you know, as the person that I am and in the networks that I'm involved in. So I came back and got very involved in the cultural and academic boycott of Israel, um, which, I, you know, I, I know that it's a very tense subject. And I just like to point out that, you know, the boycott is to do with the state funding of events. It's not to do with any individual's uh, religion, ethnicity, um, or even their beliefs, you know, it's not to do with, with silencing Zionist speakers, it's to do with who's paying for that, who's paying for that event. Um, so, you know, and in the process of getting involved uh, in this campaigning, um, I've joined an interfaith community um, in which, you know, many Jewish people are playing prominent roles as leaders. So, you know, I feel very strongly that this is absolutely not an anti-Semitic cause, you know, this is an anti-racist cause. Uh, and it's about creating, you know, a, I would hope eventually, you know, I've come to actually support a one state solution, because it is one state already, it's a de facto one state, but it's an apartheid state. So for me, it's about, you know, that South African connection, as you know, Desmond Tutu um, also argued, um, about you know the the need is to overturn the the apartheid conditions there. So this poem is called Indelible. It's in memory of Razan Al Najjar, who you people will probably remember as the the young twenty one year old paramedic who was killed while wearing her white coat um, while attending to the wounded um, it, during the Gaza March of Return when um, Israeli sniper fire was turned on. Um, uh, protesters um, at the border of Gaza. Indelible. In memory, Razan Al Najjar. Her mother clutches the evidence. A white coat, no longer white, but rust red, blotched, like the hide of a gazelle, discarded by drunken poachers after slaughtering the herd. As cameras circle, news feeds buzz. This woman's grief points like a finger to a truth beyond proof. Its red crescent still just visible. This vest is mercy's banner. Sunset stained. Thank you, Naomi. Mm -hmm. um, just want to take a second to just think about mm -hmm. that. But... I mean, something that you said to me when we've discussed political poetry, you, you said to me that it's essential for political poetry to be grounded in lived experience. Mm -hmm. And I wonder how you navigate that in a poem like this, where it's about someone else, like in this way. Well, although I didn't make it evident in the poem, um, because it was such a short poem, um, and I felt that maybe that context was a bit of scaffolding that didn't need to be there. But it is based on a video uh, that I saw of uh, Razan al Najjar's mother. Uh, and she was being interviewed by Ibrahim Hewitt, who is the head of Interpal, which is a Muslim charity that works in Gaza and, and in the refugee camps in Lebanon and, and Jordan. 
And I know Ibrahim Hewitt because Interpol invited me to Lebanon to visit the refugee camps there. So if you can see that, you know, it, it it's not me just kind of parachuting myself in. There is there is a connection, although, as I say, I just didn't feel that in this particular case that was necessary for the poem. Mm. Yeah, uh, I think it's a, a stunning poem. This I, the, the the title itself indelible, and then this idea of sunset stained these these images and everything that is blotched and rust red and stained throughout mm. the poem i think mm. it's a really interesting image um yeah i think that that's the objective correlative isn't it i mean that's that's what we need to find as poets is the physical images that carry all the emotional weight and also if you like the the values and the morals because although i think that there is a really strong bias against political poetry in the UK, uh, not so much in America at all, um, where they have got that strong tradition of the Beats, for example, and people like Adrian Rich and Audre Lorde. Um, here, it feels as though you're supposed to always, you know, whatever you say, say nothing. You know? um, it's not um, not fair to Seamus Heaney to put that totally on his shoulders, but. Um, I think there I think there is a desire here just to you know to choose the grain of sand you know find the grain of sand um, and sometimes that grain of sand has been so polished that you can't really see you know the, the, perhaps the you know the, the source of, of of you know the poet's uh, you know particular uh, angst or anger at the time so you know I, I I chafe against that okay Naomi I think it would be nice to hear the next poem that you have pr- planned. Yes. Okay. So thank you. I was going to, so, but as I say, with my cultural activism, um, I've done a lot of editing um, and of Palestinian poetry. I edited an anthology of Palestinian poetry and translation, A Blade of Grass, New Palestinian Poetry for Smokestack Books. And this is a sonnet that I wrote about the process of editing a bilingual anthology in, in, when what, I couldn't understand or even read one of the languages. A monoglot proofreads Arabic. As I adjust the fonts and spacing, correct mirrored diacritics, use pattern recognition to spot egregious typos, find homes for orphaned lines, I suppose my dedication might seem odd, a misplaced semicolon in the holy book of love, clasping sentences that ought to stand apart. But cut and pasting perky camels, little hats, jasmine ovules and felucas, I understand this script with its inky incense tendrils, is tattooing and lassoing me into its fragrant depths, a fate I quietly embrace. For sometimes when I paint brown lines around my eyes, draw a crimson bow for the arrow of my tongue, It seems I've spent my life in service of a language I can neither read nor speak. It's a really impressive thing, actually, to be editing something when you can't speak the language. I mean, how how do you even do that, really? Well, the idea to start with was that the poems would be translated from Arabic and that Arabic poems would have already been published and wouldn't need editing. But then I very quickly realised that, you know, due to the refugee crisis that the Palestinians have been undergoing for 70 years, um, you know, many Palestinians don't don't speak Arabic. Um, Their mother tongue is another tongue, Um, often English, but not certainly not always. Um, So I realized that I was going to have to do some back and forward translation if I wanted it to be bilingual. So I assembled, uh, you know, an editorial advisory board, a team, you know, of Arabic speakers and bilingual poets who who helped me um so I certainly you know wasn't you know trying to just do this on my own um in the end but it was a real learning process um you know that understanding that uh of this two-way traffic between the languages Mm. and there's one line that really sticks out at me when you say I suppose my dedication might seem odd Mm -hmm. and I mean it makes me think of lots of things but it also makes me think of the, the general barrier, I suppose, of cultural activism when you're in this country and trying to help another country. Mm-hmm. And I wonder um, I wonder where you see yourself fitting into it all and where your place is in this cultural activism. 
Well, I think it's in a place of translation, really. And, you know, it's a complicated and problematic space. But I think if we didn't have it, you know, we would become so uh, isolated from each other and, and so divided. Um, it wouldn't bear thinking about. So, you know, I just try and keep that bridge open. And, you know, I'm I'm in a fortunate position at Waterloo Press uh, where I can publish work in translation. So, you know, I've published... Uh, Argentinian poetry and right now I'm editing a, a, a Ukrainian novel uh, it was actually written in Russian as that's the writer's first language but it's very much about Ukraine um, and so I you know I've been you know and then I, therefore I'm in a position of communicating and emailing with people as well um, and trying to promote you know promote the work I, yeah, I love the idea of you being the role of communicator and translator. Mm -hmm. And I think it also, I mean, it, it links in nicely to the work that you mm -hmm. do with, um, is it the British Writers for mm -hmm. Palestine? Yes. So yeah. that was um, that was very much a campaigning group. And we wrote a lot of letters um, around the, the boycott. So, you know, for example, when Ian McEwan uh decided to accept the Jerusalem Prize. Uh, we objected and asked him not to take it. Um, and he refused our you know, request, but it did uh, spark a quite significant conversation in The Guardian with not just our letters, but also letters coming from um, you know, Israelis, um, boycott from within the, the group of, of Israelis that support boycott. Um, so, you know, and, and, and a response from him you know, so I, I felt that we, we we got we got to make it mainstream. You know, it's 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 a mainstream argument. You know, the idea that you can choose not to do something, you can choose not to buy something. You have you, you have the right to choose what to do with your own money. You know, in terms of of um, of commercial boycotts, um, but the principle extending that principle to culture is comp You know, I think I understand that it's difficult for older people, but the the point is this situation has been going on for over seventy years, and and it's only getting worse. So if you refuse to allow a non-violent uh, protest um, that's, you know, been used throughout history, boycott, boycott is part of abolitionism, um, then what are you telling the Palestinians? You know, what what options are you, are you giving them? You know, to me, uh, a non-violent campaign is a way of breaking a cycle of violence. So that's why I support it. One of the reasons I support it, yeah. yeah. Um, I think it's time to hear your next poem. Okay. Yeah, so this, um, these poems I've been reading are from my third collection, Adamantine, which is published by Pig Hog Press, uh, uh, which is an imprint of Red Hen in uh, America, in Pasadena. So I was grateful to them for taking me on. Um, and so I'm going to read the title poem, uh, which is dedicated to Elizabeth Fritzl, who's the Austrian woman who was kept captive in um, her, the cellar of her family house by her father and uh, severely abused by him for, I think, about 20 years and obviously bore his children. And, you know, we all, we all know her story. Adamantine for Elizabeth Fritzl. Chained in the cellar until the chain interfered with his pleasure. Rats, your only company water flooding down the walls. You were bone cold all winter, sweltered through the summers as your family splashed in the swimming pool above you, an alibi luxury built to explain the earth your filthy burrow had displaced. Down there, to punish you for the tiniest defiance, he plunged you into darkness for days on end the only light shed by the brutal pawn he made you reenact. He barely ever spoke, delivered your seven babies with dirty scissors and disinfectant, incinerated one, took three upstairs to believe you'd abandoned them, left three with you in that sunless hole, grey-skinned ghosts with rotting teeth, forced to grow up watching, over and over again, a wolf with their own features, devouring their mother. 
I don't know how you did it. But Elizabeth, you survived. Didn't starve yourself to death. Didn't smash your brains out. Didn't do to your children what he did to you. Your father chose you for his own because you were uncontrollable, a truant with a lip on her, a climbing rose he couldn't train. But you were always your own lodestone, a glinting adamant, hidden, growing, drilling through the walls of that other buried cell, the dugout air raid shelter his mother forced him down into alone when the bombs began to fall. It's such a, such a cruel story, um, but such an act of defiance that you've, that you've shown from Elizabeth. And I wonder why this poem, what is it about this poem that relates to the collection as a whole that, you know, it means it's the title poem. What is it about that? Well, I think that actually, the, as I recall, really, I think that the, the, the poem came first, really, and then the title of it sort of spoke so strongly to me. Um, this image of her is this, this adamant, which is, uh, it's a mineral of impenetrable hardness. Um, mm -hmm. So there was something in her that this diamond-like quality that he could not corrupt. Um, and there's also this quality of this lodestone that, you know, that then she becomes this sort of symbol, I suppose, for so many women of, of surviving. Um, you know, the lodestone is like also gives is the moral compass as well. And that to me, that connected with all the political poems in the book, even if they weren't particularly to do with violence against women. Um, this idea that you have, you know, you set a moral compass for yourself in life. Um, so, yes, I think those those were the connections, really. Mm. Again, trying mm. to find that um, that that sensual image, and in this case, it was the one that just kept on giving because I don't I didn't know about the lodestone really when when I first wrote the poem. I added the word lodestone later um, after mm. researching the the, 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 mm. um, the word a little more. Mm. Yeah, it's a fantastic image. Yeah. Um, I think there's lots in that poem that you kind of want to sit with and mm. think about for a while, mm. and you read it mm. so um sensitively um yes it's a beautiful piece well it's also about cycles of violence obviously because you know i was reading about the trial and you know about his childhood although it is this you know say very cruel it's just like oh, the cruel fa fairy tale imagery in there as well because it's almost like the only way that we can kind of cope with hearing the story in a way is to sort of relate to that grim grim tale this ogre you know we put put in that side of our brain yeah. um but, you know, when you realise, you know, what, what he suffered as a child, so he was, the, the stories vary as to whether he was sent down alone and therefore didn't know if his mother was going to survive or whether she went down without him. But in any case, they were separated. Um, and so he kind of, you know, the, the psychologist who interviewed him said that he basically recreated that scenario um, and just play, played, played it out throughout his life. So it was kind of, um, you, you know, it was a, it was a traumatic stress, post-traumatic stress syndrome that, that he was um, projecting um, so devastatingly onto his daughter. Yeah. You know, and, and I write poems in the book as well. I've got poems of, um, where I, about Esther, so the Jewish heroine, um, you know, who saves her people. So, you know, I, I, I do appreciate the complexity of the, um, you know, the histories that have resulted in the, you know, the... the the, the grinding collision in in Israel Palestine, you know. So I hope that's also clear to readers of the book, of my book. Mm. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, now we have a few more from this book before we hear a couple more from another book, mm -hmm. um, and this takes a slightly different turn. I'll let you explain. Yes. So um, thank you. In 2016, I had another diagnosis. I had a diagnosis of uh, breast cancer. Um, so I've just had my five-year clear mammogram. So I I'm, I'm, feel like I'm out of the woods with that. Um, but obviously, it was a very intensive period um, of surgery. Uh, quite, uh, in my case, 
fortunately minor surgery because the chemotherapy worked really well in my case. It totally disappeared the tumours. Um, I had a kind of a total response, but um, but there was a lot of insomnia, uh, a lot of time off, and a lot of poems that came out. So I'm going to read three in a row. Forbade. So this is sort of a morning song and a song generally a, a poem uh, about the parting of lovers in the morning. Forbade. No birds. No iPod genius mix. Just the hum of the extractor fan. The gleam of a tap and the gentle parting of fingers, combing for hair, long dark spirals suspended in water, stranded like those on my pillowcase, abandoning my scalp, floating free of this wakeful dream, until I gather and lift them to the rim of the bath, a ray of fine etching of unravelling nests, chased by a fleet chemic moon. Under this spell, I am unrecognisable, a failure in the stream, trailing frail pondweed, the Lady of Shalott, weaving poisoned locks into half-sick lover's knots, as water drips, cells shrink, a soapy mirror melts, and crowning my lost night, the force of a skull seeks the touch of light. Rough justice. The UK lifetime cancer risk rate is now one in two. Everybody has cancer. Abnormality lurks in the renaissance walls of our cells. Chemo's the new mercury, metallic assassin. It works its sizzling way through our veins, stripping perks, searing nerves, scorching hair, hissing as it kills. Everybody has cancer. Abnormality lurks in the twist of a helix, an innocent cough, the quirks of a habit somewhere well to other spells, chemos, the new mercury. Metallic assassin, it works to a contract signed at birth, a fleet of scarlet mercs, sharking through intimate tunnels, pillowy hills. Everybody has cancer. Abnormality lurks like obscene graffiti hyena. God circle jerks in our breasts, our brains, our souls, dark wells. Chemos, the new mercury, metallic assassin, it works like cat. Casanova's quicksilver, scalding his irksome eleven infections, a long dose of fresh hells. Everybody has cancer, abnormality works. Chemo's the new mercury, metallic assassin. It lurks. The cancer breakthrough will not take place in a lab or corporate boardroom, won't foam in a test tube, blink in code on a screen be hawked for megabucks by Big Pharma, or flood the world's RSS feeds. The cancer breakthrough is happening now, and again, and again, in the echoing space, that cold ocean of years, between one heart and another. Thank you, Naomi. Mm -hmm. um, wonderful to hear those read as a trio, I think. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it's it's really nice that these sorts of make the struggles of the collection more personal as well. Mm -hmm. And it means the collection, it can show both um, conflicts within our own bodies as well as external conflicts. Um, but particularly the, what can be the overriding strength of humans. Mm -hmm. uh, is, is that how you see it, this section fitting into the collection as a whole? I wanted to get your thoughts on it. Yes, I think you know there is a there is a theme of of women's resistance uh, in um, in the book, and so this was you know it's a tip tip really. So the second half is you know how how I had to find strength in in my life under conditions that uh, you know that of of you know existential hardship really that that I had to face um, uh, and. And that, and that also many many women do. Um, so uh, you know, and obviously in in many countries without the benefits of of free healthcare and 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 early detection. So um, you know, I do re totally recognise. You know, I was very privileged in the treatment that I got. Um, but but it still was, you know, uh, really uh, uh, an ordeal. Um, mm -hmm. And but through which you know as the cancer breakthrough poem tries to express, you know, I actually, you know, received so the grace of so much love 
um, that, uh, and healing, emotional healing with people in my life, uh, that, uh, you know, actually looking back now, I am grateful for the experience. Um, mm. Oh, it's fantastic that you can have that perspective mm -hmm. on it now and have mm -hmm. that approach to it. Oh, well, you know, one in two, you know, we're, we've, we're not really going to live forever, you know, and cancer is one of the ways that the body dies. And, and as we get better and better at curing other diseases, more and more people will have cancer. And I think that, um, you, you know, the silver lining of cancer, uh, although it can obviously be a very dark cloud, is that you, you, you do get a bit of time so you can you can reassess things and you can reach out and you can try and make those connections with people um, if you want to if you feel like that um, would, would be good for you i think um it would be nice to we've got a couple more poems planned uh, these are from a different um mm -hmm. this is your pamphlet in portents um Yes, I think the first one that we've got to hear is the title poem, so I'll hand over yeah, to you. Thank you. So, yes, yeah, so these are from, from Impotence, which is my uh, new pamphlet from Waterloo Press. Uh, and the title is A Coinage, um, and it's uh, a word I coined to convey my feelings leading up to the general election of 2019. So, in, you know, in a way impotent, even though I did actually try and go and campaign actually against Boris Johnson in his constituency, um, did some door knocking for Labour there. Um, also a very important time, obviously, um, that paradox and uh, being caught in that vice in this crucial time. But then the idea of portents and impotence, like not portents, you know, I, 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 although I have read tarot for cards for a living. I always feel like the future is still um, unwritten, that the tarot cards are just a guide, really. They're to help us find our way and navigate our way. So this idea of portents and omens, I wanted to challenge a little bit, even though sometimes, you know, you can have a portent, but then you still have to interpret it. So that I, I suppose that's my feeling about portents and omens. So in portents, the week before the election of the dictator, People hotly debated whether Friday the 13th was a lucky or unlucky date. The day before the election of the dictator, over 300 starlings were discovered dead in a country lane. The day of the election of the dictator, rain clobbered the streets, but hope still chattered in the air. The first day of the dictatorship, a storm on the other side of the world, dumped tens of thousands of fat innkeeper worms on a beach, a pale pink tsunami of a species also known as penis fish, for its striking resemblance to the semi-tumescent member of a unitesticular Caucasian adult male. An hour before their corpses were found, the starlings had been seen in murmuration. The post-mortem revealed they died of trauma an internal bleeding, consistent with flying hard into the road. I feel like there's lots to pick up on in there, but I'm just so struck by the um, by the starlings. Mm. Like the, I, I remember hearing about that and it being so odd. Mm. The whole thing. I know. Yeah, I still don't know if there is actually a you know that uh, hypothesis. You know, uh, all they could really say is yeah. They're, that's why they, they died because they hit the road um, yeah. and it just seems like such an image of you know what should be a beautiful collective you know of humanity really should be a beautiful collective as you know we are an incredible species um, but so often we, we do that we're on and we are now you know on this uh, nightmare course to taking the biosphere down with us so you know obviously the imagery of the storms as well and the, um, perhaps mass extinction you know in this poem it's an it's an ominous poem but the collection as a whole um, you know I think definitely tries to well does celebrate people people resisting yeah mm. you know yeah, and dictatorship yeah. might seem over the top to some people but you know I really um, have watched you know, this government's attack on the judiciary, for example, um, lying to parliament, you know, total erosion of democracy, um, you know, it, it, it is a form of Trumpism. So, uh, 
you know, it, then it's very worrying to me that they, you know, if they were to be in power another 12 years or even, then, you know, well, unfortunately we got them probably for another three. Mm. Um, anyway, those are my political views. Well, yeah. I mean, I have um, another question that sort of links to the last poem that you'll read. Mm. But I, I mean, I, it's a, a general but quite a big question. But I wonder um, what purpose you think that political poetry has? And how, how does it serve you and what... Do you write it as a form of release or do you hope that it can instigate some sort of change? Um, well, I think that the change changes occur when people get together and demand changes and, and no change will happen without that activism um, and without laws changing uh, and institutions taking note, institutions changing um, their policies and procedures and their outlook. Uh, so all of that has to be done for change to occur. But I think that I think that poetry can kind of give people in those movements some sort of uh, moral support. Um, you feel like you're not alone. Um, yeah, you, you, your values are, uh, you know, given some dignity in a poem. Um, they're put in the context of a kind of a, maybe a broader broader connections, broader worldview as well, often. Mm -hmm. um, so, so much of, of activism has to be about pushing and demanding, and there's a kind of, you know, there's a tone in it that has to be there, um, you, you know, to, to make headway. Uh, but, but all the political people I know are fully rounded human beings and, and, and need love and beauty um, and rest and, and self-care as much as, as or even more than, than, than others. So I think poetry um, can can bring all of that together, you know, can bring politics and psychology and spirituality and, and, and nature together in a way that validates uh, progressive politics. Mm. I love, um, one thing that you said, I love the idea of poetry um, giving people's values dignity. Mm -hmm. I think that's a really really nice mm -hmm. idea something to cherish um and we have got one more poem from you and i think it might be nice to to end on a reading so people can just sit with the, okay. the last poem so I, I want to say now thank you so much naomi for joining us on meet the poet it's been really lovely chatting with you um and to hear your work and of course, everybody at home, thank you for watching as well. Um, I hope that if you have any uh, comments or questions on Naomi's work, you can just leave them in the chat box. And um, Naomi, I'm sure would love to see what you think of it all. Um, do drop us a like if you enjoyed the video and follow us on all of our socials and sign up to our poetry mailing list. Um, but that's, that's it from me for now. Just thank you so much, Naomi, for joining me today. And I'll hand over to you for your last poem. Well, thank you, Flory, and um, everyone who's who's watching. Uh, and yeah, and I'd be very happy to answer questions in the chat. Absolutely. So this is the final poem, and I think I'll just. I don't think it will need introduction. I think the title gives it introduction. On watching Edward Colston get dumped in Bristol Harbour. Was there a poem in the long grass today? In the black spotted blood drop of a ladybird claiming a stem, the reticence of nettles at a distance, that enormity of sky beneath which other people marched from Minneapolis to London, Amsterdam to Accra. If so, I didn't find it, nestled as I was on the crest of a hill between tower block and garden center Spider web and iPhone, failure and elation, a white friend with an elder flower posy, acknowledging her fear of black men on the street at night, and at my back, licking its blue lips, the history hungry sea. He had walked through Almerton to rest and lie in thin December sun, uncrushed. Not timid, but perfect there. His dream words fished out beside an untrimmed singing verge.